Hey, what's up? Hello, everyone. Welcome into Fantasy Film Ball, and this is a special episode. It's just me here. I just found out the other day that there is a draft of the screenplay of the new Francis Ford Coppola movie, Megalopolis, that's been floating around on the internet. It just premiered this week, and I wanted to get some insights, see what I could glean from this old draft of Megalopolis, and see what I could learn about what this movie really is. I'm here to hopefully demystify and sort of give you some insights into what sounds like one of the strangest movies of 2024. What is Francis Ford Coppola cooking up? Why did no one want to fund this film? Is it going to be a huge mess or is it going to be a masterpiece? I'm here to hopefully clarify some of those questions. This is going to be a mostly spoiler-free video. Uh, I'm not going to be a dickbag about it. If you're here wanting to learn vague details about Megalopolis, good. I'm not going to talk about any spoilers for the first, like, three quarters of this video. I will get into spoiler territory later because I'd like to discuss the film a little bit deeper. So if you want to hear all of those details, those will be at the end of the video. But at first, I'm just going to give a more vague description. And something worth noting is that because the draft of the screenplay that I read is from the either late 80s or early 90s, I don't know what has changed from this. It's entirely possible that everything I say here could have been changed for the actual movie. I'm sure some details will have been kept the same, but I don't know exactly what is going to be a real spoiler for the movie and what has just been cut out of the draft. So with all that said, let's start off by talking about what is Megalopolis. You might have heard that this is Francis Ford Coppola's passion project. Obviously, Francis Ford Coppola is one of the golden boys of the new Hollywood movement. His films The Godfather, The Godfather Part Two, for which he won Best Picture back to back. And then he made The Conversation in 1974, same year as The Godfather Part Two, a second Best Picture nomination, same year, and a can palm door and then of course he won a second can palm door in 1979 for apocalypse now this man was on fire in the 1970s his messy productions are long long documented francis ford coppola is known to go over budget over schedule and in the case of apocalypse now the film basically drove him and his entire crew insane, which is documented in the brilliant documentary Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse, one of my favorite documentaries of all time, and I agree with the character Abed from Community. Ever seen Hearts of Darkness? Way better than Apocalypse Now. It's all documented there. Francis Ford Coppola is a messy, messy filmmaker. If you want something done cheap and you want something done quick, you do not hire Francis Ford Coppola. In 1981, MGM was funding Coppola's follow-up film to Apocalypse Now. It was a rom-com called One from the Heart. At least it was meant to be a rom-com. Coppola decided that he wanted the film to be a little bit more ambitious, and he rejected the funding from MGM and decided to fund the film completely out of pocket. And the movie was a massive critical and financial flop, it bankrupted him. So coming out of his golden decade of the 1970s, suddenly Francis Ford Coppola has made a massive misfire. So after that, he kind of went into a chain of making films for the studios, such as The Outsiders, Rumblefish, which is one of my favorite Francis Ford Coppola movies. And in the 90s, he did a surefire hit with The Godfather Part 3 and a string of other studio pictures that he was using to get himself out of debt to make Megalopolis. Bram Stoker's Dracula, Jack and the Rainmaker all of those were sort of a I'll do this one for you and then I'll make the movie for me which was meant to be Megalopolis it was set to go into production in the early 2000s there were table reads happening with a variety of A-listers like Leonardo DiCaprio they shot 30 hours worth of time-lapse and b-roll footage filmed with Ron Frick the director of Baraka and Samsara the film was set to be produced in the very early 2000s but Coppola ended up up throwing the whole film 
out after the events of 9-11 as he didn't know how he could make this film anymore in the wake of a tragedy happening in New York City. Later in the video, maybe you'll understand a little bit more of why he couldn't make the movie right after 9-11. After throwing out Megalopolis, Francis Ford Coppola has only made three movies. Of those three films, Tetro is the only one that's been well received, which is why a lot of people are really skeptical about Megalopolis. Has Francis Ford Coppola lost it? And did he leave behind all of the massive talent he had back in the 1970s? But that's why I'm really excited for this film. Megalopolis seems like the movie that he's been wanting to make for his entire career. Francis Ford Coppola for the last 30 years has been camped out in Napa Valley making and selling wine. He sold the majority of his vast winemaking empire to fund this movie. This is an all-out gamble for Francis Ford Coppola. It's been rumored it might be his last film. He's really putting everything that he has into this project. What is this crazy $120 million passion project that seemingly no one else wanted to touch? It's a great question because everyone seems to have a really hard time describing Megalopolis, including the stars of the film. Adam Driver, when asked to explain what the movie was, he just said, you can only really understand Megalopolis when you've seen it. There have been a lot of people saying things like that, which has been frustrating as an Oscar predictor, because I'm sitting here thinking, well, is this Bardo? Is this some a weird, absurd art project? What is it? Well, I'm here to tell you, it's not that hard to explain. Megalopolis is a dystopic sci-fi movie set in the seemingly near future New York City. The draft I read uh, it follows the story of an architect, Serge Cataline, seemingly been renamed Caesar for the movie version. He's an architect who leads New York City's Design Authority, which is an organization that rules over all of New York, all of the decisions of planning and building within the city. This is a very big deal. And these architects with the design authority are seen as celebrities or politicians. They are members of high society. There is an empty plot of land in New York that has been cleared out and it's meant to be built on. The mayor of the city plans to build a major mall slash casino complex on this empty plot of land and he wants to call it City World. Meanwhile, Serge Cataline wants to build a massive housing development called Megalopolis. And Megalopolis is set to be built from a new material that Serge has designed called Megalon, which could essentially save the world. In Serge's vision of what Megalopolis could be, he believes that this could lead to the end of the class divide. He believes that it could make it so that people no longer have to labor to live, erasing all debt to these financial organizations and destroying the need for capitalism. And those big dreams come directly into conflict with the old guard of the city, such as the mayor and the big banks. These financial interests seek to destroy Serge and his megalopolis project before he can build it. There's also a love story going on here between Serge and the mayor's daughter, Julia. And then there's some family drama stuff, lots of other things. I won't dig too deep into those yet. Again, I'll get into the spoiler elements later, but that is the general gist of megalopolis. It's a pretty typical sci-fi dystopian film about class divides and the way that the capitalist upper class will stifle genuine progress out of fear of losing their status. So why did no studios want to touch this movie? It seems pretty normal, right? No one wanted to touch Apocalypse Now either, so it's not necessarily a death sentence that no one wanted to fund this film. Coppola just has a reputation. Apocalypse Now was five years after Coppola had won back-to-back -back Best Pictures, and no one wanted to give him money for the film, so he just made it himself. If that was five years after he won Best Picture for The Godfather and The Godfather Part Two, imagine how studios feel about him 50 years after The Godfather and The Godfather Part Two. Probably not that great. It makes sense why he's making this film on his own. It says nothing about the quality of Megalopolis that no studios were funding this, and everything about their confidence in Coppola to make a film film under budget and on schedule, which we know from the production reports he didn't do. He went over budget, over schedule again. That said, there are also a lot of controversial themes in this film. I'll talk about those a lot later, but Megalopolis does touch on some very taboo topics that had me feeling 
a pretty big yikes while reading it. Again, I don't know what's been kept, what's been cut, but if you put this draft that I read on screen, there's some things that would make audiences squirm. So this feels like studios avoiding the next Babylon. It's going to be big, it's going to be audacious, but it's risky that audiences might not really respond to a film as hedonistic as as this one is. But I don't think Francis Ford Coppola cares if this movie flops, although he seems very, very confident that this is going to be a financial hit. So let's talk about the screenplay. The draft that I read was written either in the late 80s or the early 90s. It's undated, but you can very much tell that this is from a different time. Now, you obviously want to know is this film as good as The Godfather or Apocalypse Now? And right now, I would say no, it's not. But that's a very, very high bar. In fact, it's a bar that Francis Ford Coppola has resented for his entire career. He's talked about how The Godfather was a curse because it meant that everything he ever does after that is going to be measured up against that impossible task of is it as good as The Godfather? It's, it's not but it's still very, very good. And it's very much a Francis Ford Coppola script. The ambition is massive, especially in the back half of this Leviathan of a script. The dialogue is really interesting to read. It often feels displaced from time in a way that could either be 50 years in the future or a thousand years in the past. They speak in such a florid manner uh, that it really could be anywhere in time. And it's very theatrical to read. And I assume being performed, it would be very theatrical as well. They also use the gossiping and the whispering among the upper class, almost like a Greek chorus, which is a really interesting choice. The script, 212 pages, it is very, very long, and it feels really bloated. If they were to film this script as read, and we're assuming a page equals a minute, this would be longer than Killers of the Flower Moon. And Killers of the Flower Moon's screenplay was only 155 pages. So wild with this at 212 pages. I have heard from reports of the early screening that it's only just a little bit over two hours. So I assume that they have taken a machete to this and probably cut like a hundred pages of this screenplay. In the script I read, the first act takes up 61 pages and the majority of that is just men in rooms talking about the things that they are going to build in the future. The actual spectacle of Megalopolis begins like halfway through, like over a hundred pages in. I can definitely forgive this type of buildup in a Francis Ford Coppola movie. I love the buildup in his films like The Godfather, which is a masterful example of this type of thing, where the first like 45 minutes to an hour is all just in a wedding with no real plot, just setting up characters, establishing relationships. He's a master of wasting time in a very effective way, but if this was any other writer, I would be begging to get to the damn point to move the story along rather than just leading us up for like a hundred pages before anything really meaningful happens. There's a lot of problematic stuff in the draft I read of Megalopolis. I don't know what's going to be kept, what's going to be gutted. Even just on a description level, the draft that I read has some deeply baked misogyny to it. Real like she breasted boobily down the stairs type stuff. A lot of women in this film who are only described by how sexy they are. Uh, in fact, the character played by Aubrey Plaza, I I'm just going to flash on screen how her character is described when she first shows up here. Basically, wow, Baltimore, the sexiest sexy that has ever sexied. And she's so sexy that people call her wow, because that's what they say when they see how sexy she is. So like, that's the vibe of this screenplay. It was written in a very different time. But the most important thing that I'm going to say is that Coppola's vision shines through. You can see the complexity of this futuristic society that he's built here, uh, building on top of our old one, like how modern day Rome exists on the site of a decayed empire. I'm excited to see how he brings this vision to life. I'm most curious to see how the material Megalon is depicted, because in the screenplay, it seems to be a mostly undefinable, shapeless mass that can kind of be whatever he wants it to be at any point. It's a really cool idea. I have no idea how it would look on screen, but while I was reading, I was sort of picturing Megalopolis made of this undefinable material to look a little bit like Dr. Manhattan's Crystal Palace on Mars in the comic book and film 
Watchmen. It's clear just from reading this that the production elements are going to be a knock out of the park. Uh, the vision is so clear and it's so grandiose. He spent 120 million or more dollars on this movie. It's going to look like a movie that has that budget. The Oscar prospects of Megalopolis are very much going to be determined on how certain details are handled. This is clearly going to be a beautifully made film with ambition and with vision, but the issue is that there's some elements of Megalopolis that might veer into a territory of being too much in a similar sense to how Babylon was too much a few years ago. I will talk about all of those details later on so if you want to hear all of my concerns about why this might be too much hang on for a little bit later. Uh, but I will say if this fails at the Oscars it's not because it's some weird art project. It's not because it's Bardo. It's because it's Babylon. My current Oscar prospects for this I think even if this is a massive disaster I think people want to see Francis Ford Coppola succeed to a point where I see this getting nominations no matter what. Even if it's a financial failure, even if critics are less than hot on it, unless they're outright destroying the film, I think this film will get nominations, including Best Picture. If this is received around the same level as Babylon, think a yellow high 50s Metacritic score, I would say this gets into Best Picture because the passion will be there. I am going to go into some plot details. Nothing major. Everything that I'm going to talk about here happens in the first 10 to 20 pages of the script. So if you want to know absolutely nothing, tap out here. If you're cool with knowing what's going to be in the trailer, basically, then you can keep watching and I'll let you know when I'm going to get into the real spoiler material. Let's talk about some of the characters and the actors that are going to be playing them. So Adam Driver plays Serge Catiline, seemingly renamed Caesar in the film version, uh, which I think is a great name change because it kind of gets into the megalomania uh, and it kind of gets into the idea of this emperor. He's a leader, he's a visionary, and yet he's also a really questionable guy. One of the first things that we're told about Serge, aka Caesar, Caesar, is that he was on trial for the murder of his wife. This leads me to what I believe is one of the major themes of the movie. Coppola seems to be speaking a lot about the separation of art and artist. Can we appreciate something beautiful or something potentially world-changing made by someone who is terrible. Megalopolis is a story that is full of total scumbags, but it's putting forward this proposition that all of society has been built by scumbags and terrible people. It alludes a lot to the Founding Fathers and their transgressions, specifically Alexander Hamilton. It seems to be implying a tie between being a genius, being someone who can move and change the world, while also being an asshole. And I can't tell exactly where Coppola stands on this idea of the separation of art and artist, but his casting, where he hired Shia LaBeouf, Dustin Hoffman, John Voight, all in pretty major roles, it seems pretty intentional in the way that he's hiring people who have very poor reputations for their on-set conduct. It becomes a sort of meta statement about the separation of art and artist that feels a lot like when Kanye West brought Marilyn Manson onto his album Donda. But I, I'm gonna say right now, I think Coppola does it in a much smarter way. In a way, I, I think that Serge slash Caesar represents Francis Ford Coppola himself. I think he sees himself as a flawed idol, someone who has done amazing things but questions whether his own work still holds value with his reputation for being difficult, with his reputation for being an asshole on set, uh, being very hard to work with. Can Francis Ford Coppola's work hold value if he sees himself as a bad person? That's the big question here, and Francis Ford Coppola is much more interested, as many great filmmakers are, he's more interested in the questions than he is in the answers. Then there's the role of Mayor Frank Cicero. It was previously believed that Forrest Whitaker would be playing this character, but from the reports coming out of the early screening, it sounds like Giancarlo Esposito is actually playing Mayor Frank Cicero. I don't know for sure, so instead of referring to Whitaker or Esposito, it's going to be one of those two, I'm just going to talk about the character. He has gotten the city into a massive pile of debt, and and he's promised the banks that he's going to build City World, this giant casino, uh, in order to take more money from the working class, to take more money from the masses, and give it to the banks to pay off the debt that he has gotten the city into. Mayor Cicero is a traditionalist, but he's also very stubborn and he's also very corrupt. He's a facade for the old guard of society. This role is very, very juicy. Lots of great monologues, lots of meaty dialogue, and 
amazing scenes for whoever plays this role, whether it's Forrest Whitaker or whether it's Giancarlo Esposito. Whoever plays this role, uh, I could see them getting an Oscar nomination for it. And then there's Natalie Emanuel, who plays Julia Cicero, one of the lead characters of the story. She is Frank Cicero's daughter, who ends up falling in love with Serge slash Caesar. Well, the female roles in Megalopolis, at least the version I read, were deeply underwritten, one-dimensional characters. Likewise, Aubrey Plaza plays the character that I mentioned earlier, who is just a one-dimensional sex object. She's a fun femme fatale character, but again, very one-dimensional in her goals. And her only purpose in the story, really, is to be pursued and to pursue men. Then let's get to my favorite character in the script. This is Claude Hamilton, who I'm assuming is being played by Shia LaBeouf. This is a completely unhinged, live wire, total wild card fucking freak of a role. And he ends up doing some pretty wild stuff through the course of this film. If Shia wasn't totally persona non grata with his abuse scandal, with the scandals of him just being an asshole on set in general, I would be predicting him for an Oscar nomination because this role is crazy and you know he's going to chew the damn scenery. Shia LaBeouf has never been a stranger to going balls to the wall madness with roles. Some real Fade Routha vibes. John Voight is going to be playing the role of Gene Hamilton, the owner of the largest bank in the country and the one pulling all of the strings throughout this story. This is a role that definitely has quite a bit to chew on, but again, John Voight is also pretty questionable person, just like Shia LaBeouf. Those are all the key players of the film. So with that said, now, this is your warning, I'm officially going to get into the spoiler territory. So if you're here, I hope you're okay with uh, maybe being spoiled for certain things. Again, I don't know, all of this could have been cut. I might be just saying nonsense that isn't actually in the final film and was left back in the 80s where, I'm gonna be honest, some of this stuff probably belongs back there. So let's first talk about why did Francis Ford Coppola cancel this because of 9-11? Well, it's because Francis Ford Coppola predicted 9-11. What's that? Yes, you heard me. Francis Ford Coppola wrote a 9-11 scene into his movie, 166 pages into the film, which is definitely not going to be in this version of the film. Someone calls the main character, says, turn on the TV right now. And when he turns on the TV, what's there? Well, it's the Twin Towers. They've been attacked. They're up in smoke. They have the Twin Towers fall on page 166, and they never fucking talk about it ever again. Never again. It's never mentioned again. Not one time is it mentioned again. It's just a thing that lingers. You're wondering, when are, why did they do that? When are they going back to that? Nope, they never do. They never go back to it. Some people have said that this movie has also predicted the January 6th attacks. I don't see as much. There is a riot that happens very late into the film. They do burn down City Hall, but it feels less directly January 6th parallels than the way that he literally blows up the Twin Towers. There's a lot of really prescient stuff, a lot of very relevant stuff in Megalopolis that is going to make this quite timely if they keep it the way it is, but I, I don't think they will. Now, let's talk about some of the controversies that's going to come. I already mentioned that Adam Driver's character allegedly murdered his wife, but a key central moment of this film happens at a concert where Adam Driver's Serge Catiline is promoting his new invention. He's talking about Megalon, this material which is made out of garbage that can basically solve all of the world's problems. And he's trying to promote it to this massive, I think it's Madison Square Garden, which is full. There's a 15-year-old pop star played by Grace Vanderwall, aka the ukulele girl from America's Got Talent, aka Stargirl from the Stargirl movie series on Disney+. Plus, She is on stage performing a song about how important it is to save yourself from marriage. And then someone hacks into the event and live streams a sex tape of Adam Driver having drugged up sex with this 15-year-old pop star. Again, Grace Vanderwall. This is the central event of the movie. It brings about Serge's semi-downfall before society seems to just forget about it and move on. I don't know if they're going to change this. It's very fucked up, but it's asking the question, can someone invent something beautiful that is appreciated while also acknowledging that they are not a good person? Worth mentioning, at this point, Coppola did not sign the Roman Polanski petition, so it's not like he's saying we should excuse these things. I think he's, again, he's just asking 
questions. They do later reveal that this pop star character is actually not 15. She is 27 years old and she's posing as a 15 year old to sell records to Christian teenage girls. But the fact of the matter is that everyone believes she's 15, including the character who is caught having sex with her. And to up the sexual deviance even more, Shia LaBeouf's character, Claude, has two sisters, both also named Claude, and it's heavily implied that he has an incestual sexual relationship with both of these young girls. They are teenagers, and he's having an incestual pedophilic relationship with both of them. So yeah, it's a fucked up film and it's going to be very controversial if they keep those elements intact film twitter is going to have a fucking meltdown about this movie i find most anti-cancel culture art to be really fucking annoying specifically comedians that talk about cancel culture and whine about how they're not allowed to say anything anymore so i'm not a big fan of really any anti-cancel culture art that i can think of but I, I think that Francis Ford Coppola is doing it in a much more interesting way. This also was written decades before cancel culture was even a whisper on the lips of a Fox News anchor. I'm curious to see how the 2024 version is going to handle some of these elements which feel so relevant in the zeitgeist. But I gotta say, I can just imagine the, the shitstorm that's going to happen when the anti-woke crowd gets to this film and their brains are going to break as they watch this. Simultaneously being like, yeah, we like this anti-cancel culture message, but also calling it a typical Hollywood pedophile movie. There's also quite a bit of stuff about immigrants, which is meant quite well, uh, but I think might cross some lines at times. LaBeouf's character becomes seen as the king of the immigrants. He ends up becoming the figurehead that unites a bunch of immigrant diasporas that typically hate each other and he unites them under one banner to oppose the mayor uh, and make a political run for himself. It reads a little bit poorly the way that they speak about it with the 1980s language but it's probably going to work a lot better with modern rewrites. The end of the film pretty messy. In this draft, the film ends with basically every main character except for the bankers dying horrible deaths. Uh, everyone dies in the end in the sense of an old tragedy, Shakespearean or Greek. Uh, they all have their flaws and they all get their comeuppance in terrible ways. The scene that you might have heard about between John Voight and Aubrey Plaza, uh, they get married at one point, him being this old banker with a lot of money, her being a young, attractive gold digger. She begins an affair with another banker and when Gene Hamilton, the John Voight character, suffers a stroke. Aubrey Plaza's character and the man that she's having an affair with, they end up getting together to strip his business for everything it's worth. The scene that I believe people are talking about, if it's what I read in the script, what happens is John Voight has actually been faking having a stroke and he brings Aubrey Plaza's character over to look at his giant bulging penis and instead of uh, his penis under the sheets of his hospital bed it's actually a bow and arrow that he then uses to shoot Aubrey Plaza's character and the man that she's having an affair with and he reveals I was never sick after all so weird excessive just like everything else in this movie but yeah the end of the film I do hope that they get rid of the cliched old everyone dies at the end except for the bankers. I guess it makes sense for the themes where ambitious seekers of change end up getting swept away and yet the ruling class, the power, they always stay in the same position. The money stays where it is uh, and yet progress will always be stifled. So I will say I really enjoyed reading Megalopolis. If I were to rate this screenplay out of 10, I would give this a 7 out of 10, but I think that the film itself has a lot of room to grow from that. Uh, I do think this is going to be a very polarizing film, but it's one that I am definitely looking forward to. Now, let me know if this video was something that you enjoyed, because uh, maybe I can make future videos like this on other upcoming films based on books or with screenplays that are floating around online. Give a little bit of a hint of what is this film really going to be. But as always, my name is Matt. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Fantasy Film Ball.